All right, so uh, we got a new unit to start today. So we're gonna start in on a new chapter, chapter 10. Chapter 10 is all about alkyl halides. All right, we actually only have two more chapters to go through this semester. Um, chapter 10 is not too bad. We'll cover all of chapter 10 this week. Chapter 11 is a little bit more of a doozy, and we will spend the two weeks on chapter 11. We got two weeks dedicated to that, it's a little bit tougher. And then that's it. So we're coming down the home stretch here. All right, so alkyl halides. What do I mean by alkyl halides? Carbons and hydrogens. Right, all single bonds plus a halogen. Right, so fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine, any organic molecule containing uh, one of those halogens and only single bonds would be an alkyl halide. All right, so the first thing we got to do with this new functional group is learn how to name it. Nomenclature of alkyl halides. So let's just look at a simple example here. All carbons and hydrogens single bonds, and then I'm gonna stick a halogen on there. So step one, as always, is to find and name the parent chain. All right, and the past few functional groups that we've studied, alkenes and alkynes, you had to change the suffix of the name here. You had a special way to uh, indicate that functional group at the end of the name. For alkyl halides, that's actually not the case. So alkyl halides, that parent chain is going to end in A-N-E, just like an alkane. All right, so we do not refer to that chlorine with any sort of a suffix. We just have our normal old alkane suffix A-N-E. So for example, in this molecule, if I'm gonna find my parent chain, it's these one, two, three carbons here. My parent chain is a propane. All right, so two, we gotta find and name our substituents. All right, and here is how we're going to indicate the presence of the chlorine in this molecule. We treat these halogens just like we do methyl groups or ethyl groups. They are just another substituent. All right, so we're gonna have names here. If you have a fluorine in your molecule, it's what we call a fluoro group. A chlorine would be a chloro group. Bromine would be a bromo group. And then lastly, iodine, an iodo group. So my substituent in this molecule here is this chlorine atom. So again, halogens are treated as substituents. Just like we do methyl groups or ethyl groups, this is a chloro group. Our next step is to number that parent chain. All right, so if I go both directions, one, two, three, one, two, three, I get the same. All right, so then lastly, we're going to assemble the name. So this would be two chloro propane. All 
right? So our new functional group, these alkyl halides, they're not really referred to in the same way as other functional groups. We don't have a special suffix for it. We just use, uh, we treat them as substituents. So we have different ways to refer to our uh, halogen substituents. And we just number our parent chain just like we did before, indicate where that substituent is in our name. All right, so these are prefixes as opposed to sitting at the back of the name. All right, one other thing that we should note here about numbering our parent chain. For the past few functional groups, we talked about how those functional groups had priority. You had to prioritize that functional group when you were numbering your parent chain. Halogens, not special. Nobody cares, all right? No special rule for numbering your parent chain with halogens. You treat them exactly as you would, methyl groups or ethyl groups. Uh, there's no sort of special consideration where you're numbering with respect to them and only, all right? So no special numbering for halogens. All right, we're going to treat them just like methyl groups or ethyl groups where we look for the lowest possible number in our name. That's all we care about. All right, so I'm going to put down a few examples, and y'all are going to name these molecules for me.
All right, so let's do this first one. Finding my parent chain, one, two, three, four carbons. So this is a butane, is my parent chain. These halogens we treat as substituents, so this would be a fluoro group. <clears throat> and if we number our parent chain, we want that fluoro group on the lowest possible number, so this would be one fluoro butane. All right. Um, let me just point out a very common spelling mistake that would maybe drive you crazy on your homework. It's not fluoro, it's fluoro, right? F L U O, not F L O U like flower. So just be careful. Super common mistake. All right, finding our parent chain. We got these one, two, three, four, five carbons, our longest continuous set. So our parent chain is a pentane. We have these two halogens we treat as substituents. So we have a chloro group and a bromo group. We're gonna number our parent chain and then I'm going to go the other way. One, two, three, four, five. In my blue numbering scheme, I have a two and a four. In my red numbering scheme, I have a two and a four. So I have a tie. How do we break our ties? Alphabetical order. So bromo comes before chloro. So I'm going to pick that red numbering scheme. So this would be two bromo. <laughs> Three chlor, no, nope, not three. Four chloro, pentane. Okay, bringing back these cyclic alkanes here. Now we're going to stick an iodine on there. Our parent chain is always the ring, remember? So these six carbons. So what's our parent chain? cyclohexane. We have our halogen substituent on there, an iodo group. All right, remember with our ring, we just always start numbering where that substituent is. So one iodo, except remember when there's only one substituent on there, of course it's going to be located on carbon one, so you don't put the one. Right, just iodocyclohexane. If there were more than one, all of a sudden you gotta start numbering to indicate where they are. But if there's only one, we already know where it is. It's on carbon one, okay? Um, another example, just using the halogens of this same sort of idea is dichloromethane. Our favorite solvent from the lab, right? If we draw out the structure of dichloromethane, Meth, methane, so one carbon. And why don't we have to put one, one dichloromethane? Because where the heck else are they going to go? Of course they're on that carbon, right? So we get to drop the number when there's no sort of ambiguity about where that substituent would go. All right, so for the last example here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons in my parent chain. I have an alkyl group here, a methyl group. I have these two chloro groups here. All right. So let's put in our numbering, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, so let's see. Uh, raise your hand if you think we should pick the blue numbering scheme, the one on top. Uh, what about the red numbering scheme? All y'all wrong. Let's look at the numbers here. Remember, those chlorines, not special at all. There is nothing special about the halogens. We treat them just like every other substituent. So let's look at our numbers here. If I pick blue, it's two, five, five. If I pick red, it's three, three, six. 
We want the lowest possible number in our name. All right, so we're gonna go with that blue numbering scheme, not the red. I'm gonna assemble it in alphabetical order still. So this would be five, five, dichloro, two, methyl heptane. I, unlike our other functional groups, they have no priority associated with them, so you just want the lowest possible number in the name. If there was a tie, then we'd break that tie with alphabetical order or something like that, but we don't even get to that point here. Our methyl group would be on carbon two, which is lower than carbon three. Cool. All right, so then two more, just kind of tying together things that we already have learned here. These aren't technically alkyl halides. Okay, if we had a double bond and a halogen in there, this would be what we'd call an alkenal halide. Uh, but nonetheless, we know how to name this thing. It's really not too bad. We just got to kind of put together all the rules that we've learned up, up until this point. We could do the same thing if we have a triple bond in there. If it was a triple bond, it wouldn't be an alkenal, but an alkynal. Halide. So I'm going to find my parent chain here, but now that this parent chain contains that double bond, it wouldn't be a butane, but a butene. And I'm just going to treat that bromo group as a substituent. All right, we're going to number. Remember, we do have to prioritize that double bond. So this would be three bromo one butene. Right, and what's the one telling me? Where the double bond is, and then the three is where the bromo group is, right? So really nothing crazy. We just treat those bromo groups, uh, those uh, halogen groups, just like we would if they were methyl or ethyl groups. Okay, so same thing here. We got to find our parent chain. One, two, three, four, five. We're going to number, well, I guess we can find our substituent. This is our fluoro group substituent. All right, and then just remember, just like our alkenes, when we number our parent chain, we have to prioritize that triple bond. That halogen isn't special, but that triple bond is. So this would be five fluoro two, Pentine.
All right, so new functional group, actually our last functional group of the semester. We're gonna spend both the next two chapters talking about these alkyl halides. So first thing we gotta do is learn how to name them, and these real ones really aren't bad at all because unlike our other functional groups, we don't have a special ending for them. We just use an alkane ending. We treat those halogens as substituents, right? So if it's a fluorine, it's a fluoro group. Chlorine's a chloro group. Bromine's a bromo group and iodine is an iodo group. Cool. All right, so now we're gonna start talking about reactions of alkyl halides, and actually first we're gonna talk about various methods for preparing alkyl halides. Um, and some of these will be review, right? When we were talking about alkenes and alkynes, we learned a bunch of ways to make alkyl halides. So we're gonna kind of summarize and build off of that. And actually what we're gonna be talking about for the rest of the day today is a new one. This is going to be preparing alkyl halides from alkanes. All right, and that's kind of surprising because alkanes, we said, are not very reactive functional groups, right? We said that they really didn't have any, very many reactions associated with them that, at all, other than you can, you know, blow them up, you can combust them, all right? But there is a type of reaction that we can do from alkanes to create alkyl halides, what we call radical halogenation. If we take an alkane, just simple old methane, and we treat it with chlorine gas in the presence of light, all right, so we use this H nu, this fancy looking V here to represent a photon, right, i.e. what light's made of. we will get a substitution reaction where that chlorine is now stuck onto our alkane, onto our carbon. All right, so what the hell? We said alkanes, not very reactive. And all of a sudden, we got this normal looking reaction here. What's going on here, okay? So this is actually a very special kind of reaction. And the key word here is that radical term, all right? So first of all, let's take a step back. We spent a good bit of time last unit talking about these bond dissociation energies. All right, everybody remember this table from our last unit here. It tells you how much energy you have to put in to break a particular bond. So first of all, one thing to note is that our halogens here are pretty much the lowest numbers on this table, right? These are pretty freaking weak bonds here between chlorine and chlorine, bromine and bromine, or iodine and iodine, right? So those halogen bonds themselves are already pretty weak to start out with, okay? The other thing we want to remember about this table is this table referred to the homolytic cleavage of bonds. Okay, which means that those bonds break symmetrically. That is not a normal way to be looking at bonds breaking. All right, so what do we mean by a homolytic cleavage? Let's just look at one of those weak halogen bonds here between two chlorine atoms. Okay, so a homolytic cleavage would mean that we're chopping this bond straight in half, 
boom, a symmetric cleavage of that bond. So that means one chlorine gets one of those electrons from that shared pair, and the other chlorine gets the other electron from that shared pair. Okay, and we talked just very barely about these unpaired electrons before, but we call them radicals. All right, and I honestly have no idea where the name radical came from, but I feel like it's very fitting because how I view these unpaired electrons is they are pissed off. They are very unstable, very unhappy to be unpaired, and so they are going to react with anything and everything around them. All right, so we take one of these halogens with their weak bonds. We can do this homolytic cleavage, which creates these radicals, all right? And it turns out for halogens, why this is relevant to this particular chapter, because those bonds are so low energy, all you need to accomplish this is a photon, right? H nu, again, just represents a photon. So if you get a nice high energy stream of light, you will break, off, break those chlorine-chlorine bonds and create these radicals. All right, so let's just look at this real quick. If I want to use my electron pushing arrows to show this bond breaking, I kind of have a problem here. Because if I do this my normal way, take our arrow, boom, boom, put it there. This would give that one chlorine atom both of those electrons from that bond and that other chlorine atom just got those electrons taken from it, right? So this is not going to represent that homolytic cleavage. These double-headed arrows, the arrows that we've been using all semester long because they're what 99.9% .9 of reactions have, these are for moving a pair of electrons. Right? That's what we've been doing all the time because electrons love being in pairs. So then how do we do these radical reactions here, these homolytic cleavage reactions? We've got to use a different type of arrow. Okay? I'm just going to move it down here so we've got some room. How we would represent this bond breaking in this homolytic cleavage way, we've got these bunny ear arrows. One coming out on one side, one coming out on the other side. And importantly, the head of the arrow here is what we would call like a fish hook head, right? Not the double-headed arrow that we're used to seeing. There's only one side that's pointed, a fish hook arrow. So this is how we would represent using electron pushing arrows, the homolytic cleavage of a bond. All right, so again, our normal arrows that we're used to seeing, these are for moving electron pairs. These fish hook arrows that we're just introducing now, these are for moving single electrons. Cool. All right, so <clears throat> again, we're going to prepare this radical here, or I'm sorry, we're going to prepare this alkyl halide here using this radical halogenation. So if we look at the mechanism for this reaction, it's got these three distinct parts to it. The first is what we were just looking at, what's called the initiation step. have a chlorine or uh, any halogen 
you hit it with that photon and you get your radical. All right, you get two of them actually. All right, and again, if we're gonna show this, the mechanism here, show our electron pushing arrows, we gotta show this bond breaking in a homolytic fashion using our fish hook arrows. So that initiation step is where we create our radical. And again, these things are mad. So they're gonna start reacting with everything and anything in that, in that flask. Okay, and that's what we call the propagation phase. Propagation, I don't know. Okay, and there are actually two, two steps that just keep on repeating here. Step one is we have our radical find our alkyl halide, or our alkane rather. All right, and what happens is that radical, that chlorine, will steal one of those hydrogens off of that alkane, leaving us with an alkyl radical, a free radical on a carbon. And we saw this like bond breaking in this homolytic fashion. The forming of a new bond using these fish hook arrows look really weird because it's not that the radical electron is kind of reaching out and grabbing an atom. It's trying to find another electron. It's trying to become paired again. So how we do this is we draw both of these arrows moving to that empty space where the bond is going to be. All right, and yes, your homework system does it wrong, so we're gonna have some pencil and paper mechanism drawing for this particular chapter. All right, this bond though has to break in a homolytic fashion, so now I have to also give one of those electrons to that carbon. All right, so then in step two, we have that alkyl radical. I'm just gonna move this down. It's gonna drive me nuts. Now we have that product from step one, that alkyl radical. It's going to go and find itself an intact chlorine molecule. And again, it's a radical, so now it's the mad one. And it's going to steal one of those chlorines. All right, so everybody take a second and draw me the product of this step here, following those electron pushing arrows, our fish hook arrows. Let me make it a little bit prettier.
All right, and so this second propagation step is where I create my alkyl halide. And what's my other product? Another chlorine radical, absolutely. So look, now I'm right back where I started to just repeat the process over and over and over again, right? Our first step in this propagation step, use that chlorine radical. And then by the end here, we made it again. So now it's just gonna go back and react with another alkane. And this is just gonna keep on going and going and going or propagating as the name would imply, okay? The sort of signature of this propagation step here is in each one, we both start with a radical on our reactant side, and then we get a new radical on our product side. All right, so again, now we've recreated that chlorine radical it's just going to go back and repeat step one over and over and over again, keep on going, keep on reacting, until finally we hit the termination step in our mechanism. All right, this whole radical propagation thing will just keep on going and going until we hit our termination step, which is where two radicals find and react with one another. Right, so for example, one of those chlorine radicals that we just created, well, it happens to bump into yet another chlorine radical. All right, these two will react with one another, pairing their electrons to form just a regular old chlorine molecule. All right, everybody take a second and put in the electron pushing arrows for this particular step. How would you draw those fish hook arrows to form that new bond? So they're going to form this new bond. Those two electrons are going to find one another, form that bond. All right, and really termination will happen any time two radicals find one another. They don't have to both be chlorines. So we could also have a situation where our chlorine radical bumps into one of those alkyl radicals. All right, that will also terminate this radical halogenation reaction, right? Kind of stop things. All right, or there's even a small chance that two alkyl radicals will find one another So then finish off this one for me by filling in both the products and the electron pushing arrows for this particular termination reaction.
right? So again, those two radical electrons find one another. So we use our bunny ear fish hook arrows to represent that. All right, that would form a new bond between those two carbon atoms. So any one of these, any situation where a radical finds another radical will terminate the reaction, right? We won't have this propagation going over and over and over again. All right, so these radical halogenation reaction mechanisms are very different than mechanisms that we've seen before because they involve these free radicals, these unpaired electrons. And no reaction that we've studied up until this point have electrons moved individually. They're always moving in pairs for, uh, with one another. So that's why we have to use these special type of arrows, these little fish hook arrows, to represent the movement of just one electron. All right, and in our mechanism here, we have three different steps. We have the initiation step, which creates the free radical to begin with. That's what light's doing in this reaction, is homolytically cleaving that chlorine-chlorine bond. When we get our chlorine radical, we get this propagation where it reacts with an alkane, forming another radical, which then reacts with a chlorine, forming another radical, and that just keeps going and going and going, creating more and more and more uh, alkyl halide throughout this reaction. All right, and then finally, we will reach the termination step when two radicals manage to find one another and create now a paired set of electrons, a, paired, uh, a shared set of electrons which, you know, ends the whole thing. We got no more radicals that are mad that are gonna continue to react. All right, so this is a method that we can use to turn an alkane into an alkyl halide, this radical halogenation. All right, so last thing we gotta talk about would be the regio selectivity of these radical halogenation reactions. So we did before just using a very small molecule, making it easy, talking about just methane. But what if we used propane in a radical halogenation reaction? Well, there are two possible products that we could get. We could get one where that chlorine is placed on that first carbon. But another, we would get a different product that was placed on that second carbon. All right, so depending on which carbon our radical reacts with, we would get a different product. So which one's the major product, which one's the minor product, right? What is the stereoselectivity of this reaction? All right, and to be clear, we only get two products because if I stuck the chlorine on either end here, on either of those two carbons, I would get the same product, right? If I draw, let's start out with our alkane. If I draw it over here, that's the same as this. Okay, and figuring out what your possible products are is going to be a big part of these part of these types of problems. Uh, if you're ever confused, like, oh man, are these two the same structure or are they different? Name it. Go through the process of naming it, and you'll be able to tell if you get the same name, they are indeed the same structure. Okay, all right, and then we get a different product should that chlorine go on that middle carbon there. Right, so we got two distinct possibilities here. Okay, and again, we're trying to figure out what's the major 
and minor products. All right, so first thing we gotta talk about, so this is gonna be a little bit more complicated of a question than it seems here. It's gonna have two important sort of factors. The first being the stability of the radical that's formed. Um, we talked about carbocation stability and how it depended on the degree of substitution of that carbon. And we see the same thing here. So it turns out that a methyl radical, right, this would be a methyl radical, has a different stability than a primary radical, where that radical forms on a primary carbon. All right, take a second to draw me a secondary and a tertiary radical. So a secondary radical right, means that that carbon that has that unpaired electron has two neighbors. And a tertiary radical means that that carbon with the radical has three neighbors associated with it, right? Three carbons, three carbon neighbors. And when we were talking about carbocations, what was the most stable? Primary, secondary, or tertiary? Tertiary, exact same trend for radical stability as well. Methyl radicals are the least stable, followed by primary, followed by secondary, and then finally the most stable are the tertiary radicals. Alright, so one major factor is going in determining what our product distribution is. What is the major and minor product is going to be the stability of those radicals. Alright, where the again the more substituted the carbon, the more stable the radical. Alright, but again, it's a little bit more complicated than just that. If we look at the first step in our propagation here your chlorine is reacting with one of the hydrogens on your alkane, right? That's the first step is to actually pull off a hydrogen and create that alkyl radical. And if we look at our starting reactant here, our propane, we don't draw them in, but if we were to draw in our hydrogens, there are only two hydrogens on that secondary carbon but there are a total of six that would lead to that one chloropropane product, right? Six in that orange group there. And to some extent, it's just a numbers game, right? The more hydrogens you have, the more likely it is that one of them are gonna be pulled off. So both of these, radical stability and number of hydrogens is going to be a factor here. So what we have is what we call, um, we're going to have this little chart here that's going to help us figure out what our major and minor product are, what we call a reactivity series. Right, 
chlorinates. So for chlorine, we see different preference for primary versus secondary versus tertiary carbons. All right, and we're going to sort of numerically put a value on how much more likely one is than the other. So for primary, we just give it the number one. Okay, and then it turns out that a secondary carbon is 3.9 times more favorable. And a tertiary carbon is 5.2 times more favorable than that. Okay, and so our distribution of products here is going to depend both on the number of hydrogens in each group multiplied by that reactivity factor we get from the table. All right, and in fact, for these particular problems, we can even go further, not just major and minor but we can actually use this table to calculate the percent composition of our products here. You know, 70% this one, 40, 30% that one, right? Okay, so it's the number of hydrogens times the reactivity factor for a particular product divided by the sum of all the carbons in that molecule times 100. All right, so how am I going to figure this out here? Okay, so for the chlorine being added to the orange carbon, my one chloropropane, this particular group has six hydrogens in it times that reactivity factor of just one because it's a primary carbon. If I look at my other product, there's only two hydrogens in this group but the reactivity factor for a secondary carbon is 3.9. So then to get my actual percent distribution here, I'm going to take these values and divide them both by the sum of the two of them. So the 6.1 plus the 2.39, uh, 2 times 3.9. times 100. So again, we can go even further than major and minor product. We can actually get percent distributions. It turns out that 43% of my product here will be the one chlorobutane and the other 57% will be the two chloropropane. All right, so yes, our major product is where that chlorine is on the more substituted carbon, all right? But it's a lot closer to 50-50 than you might have thought just by looking at radical stability. And that's, again, because there's another important factor here that's going to dictate our distribution of products. And that's just the number of hydrogens that are in that particular group. 
That orange group had a lot more hydrogens, six hydrogens compared to just two, which is what helped bump that number up to something closer to like 50-50. I mean, it's still our minor product, but just barely. All right, so what should you be able to do with everything that we just discussed here? Let's put this reactivity series over here. I'm gonna pick another alkane. We'll pick pentane. And we're going to perform this radical halogenation reaction. So step one, you should be able to draw all the possible products of our radical halogenation. And once you get all those products, you should be able to use that reactivity series to calculate the percent composition. All right, ultimately telling us what our major and minor products are, but even more so giving us numbers associated with them. So I'm going to let you all do this on your own, and then we'll work through it together. Draw me all possible products of this ra radical halogenation reaction, and then using that reactivity series, determine the percent composition.
All right, so when I'm thinking about how many, how many products should we have? What did everybody get? Three. Three, awesome, okay. And when we're thinking about this, this is very similar to how we would think about like chemically distinct groups in an NMR, right? We would also expect to see three groups of peaks here. These two groups, are these two uh, groups of hydrogens would um, absorb in the same spectrum on our NMR. These would absorb in the same portion. And then lastly, these ones, right? So just like we think about our chemically distinct carbons, same sort of thing when we're thinking about our products. If I put a chlorine on either one of those red carbons, I'm gonna get the same product, all right? So we'll have one product with the chlorine on the blue group. Another product, the chlorine on the red group. And then lastly, chlorine on the green group. All right, so we got these three possible products here. Okay, so then in order to figure out which one is our major product, we're going to have to do some math. Okay, so if we look here, there are six hydrogens that would have been in that blue group. So six times our reactivity factor for a primary carbon, which is just one. Uh, moving on here, how many hydrogens are in that red group? Four times the reactivity factor for a secondary carbon, 3.9. And then lastly, there are only two carbons in this green group. And what reactivity factor should I use? Right? Is this green carbon primary, secondary, or tertiary? It is still just a secondary carbon, right? So to be clear, I'm not gonna lump these two together just because they're secondary carbons. They don't give me the same product. So I have to treat one group as secondary different than the other group. I'll use the same reactivity factor, but they're gonna give me different products here. All right, so then if I take this and I sum them all up, oh, I just deleted it, oh geez, there we go, 29.4, so to get my percent composition, I'm going to divide them all by 29.4 and multiply by 100. All right, and at the end of the day, we find that the one chloropentane will make up about 20% of our product. The two chloropentane will be 53% and the three chloropentane 27%. All right, and if we look at these last two products in particular, it kind of illustrates the whole shtick behind this calculation. These are both secondary carbons. So yes, the radical stability for both of those are equal. So why do we get twice as much of the 2-chloro than the 3-chloro? Because again, an important factor is it's, it's a numbers game, right? You just have more hydrogens that belong to that red group than you do belonging to that green group. So that dictates our major product for this reaction. All right, and then lastly, we're gonna update this table here. We talked about our reactivity factors if we used chlorine in a radical halogenation reaction. If we used bromine, we get very different numbers here. All right, again, the primary we just say is one. Everything's relative to that. All right, but then a secondary carbon is going to be 82 times more stable or favorable rather, and a tertiary carbon, a whopping 1,640. All right, you can see that bromine is very selective for the more substituted carbon, right? If we run the same math, the same calculations that we did before, but using bromine, 
we would see that it's like 99% favorable for the more substituted. So again, we, call, we say that uh, bromine is more selective. All right, but the principle is the same. We could run through and do the math here to figure out our exact distribution. Cool. All right, um, and so next time we'll pick up, we, this is like kind of just the remainder of this particular chapter is focused on preparation of alkyl halides. What we talked about today was preparing alkyl halides from alkanes, which like was a bit of a lie that I told you earlier in the semester that there were no reactions of alkanes. So now we got one here. You can see why we waited till the end to introduce it to you guys. It's a little bit of a doozy here. It involves this radical mechanism. So we got these new electron pushing arrows that we have to use um, to illustrate that reaction. All right, and even, even more fun, we can do these product calculations as well to determine our percent distribution of the products that we get using this method. Cool.